this morning, if we could, let's stand. We're fixing to sing Revelation song. And I think about how the angels are around the throne right now. And they're saying, holy, 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 holy is he. So this morning, if we could, let's sing this song.
It's good to be here, amen? Amen. Y'all know me. If we don't get excited for the King of Kings, I'm going to tell you again. It's good to be here, amen? Come on, let's stand and give him a hand clap of praise. If you're able to stand, go ahead and love on him for just a few moments. He's worthy. There ain't never been another, and there never will be another besides Jesus Christ, amen? While you're standing, go ahead and take your Bibles. Go to the book of Esther, chapter 4. Verse 13 through 17. Now just bear with me. I know you probably have heard this preached a thousand times, but I hope that there's something that God has for somebody in this house this morning. Amen? If you got your Bibles and you're at Esther chapter 4 verse 13, say amen. 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 Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape into the king's house, more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then then Esther bade them to return to Mordecai this answer. Go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night nor day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so I will go unto the king which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to to all that Esther had commanded them. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you one more time, God, for the grace. God, thank you one more time for the mercy of God. Lord, thank you for the anointing of God. I already feel you this morning, Lord. And I ask, God, for the next few moments, God, Lord, that you'll hide me behind the cross, God. Lord, and I pray that they'll hear, God, only, God, what you have for us to hear this morning, God. Nothing less. Nothing more, God. And all the glory, all the honor, all the praise goes back to you, God, because you're the one that's worthy, God. I love you this morning, and I thank you, God, one more time that you would use me in Jesus' name. Amen. You might be seated. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be in a place that we have the freedom to worship Jesus. I'm thankful that I'm not in fear this morning worried about somebody coming through the back door saying, you know what, you can't preach that. 
You can't say this. You can't act like this. You can't get excited about this. I'm so glad I don't have to go underground this morning to have some kind of gathering with my brothers and my sisters of like precious faith. But we can come this morning. The heat's on. It's been on. I can feel it already up here. But we can come into this house this morning with brothers and sisters of like precious faith and hear what God has for us freely. Amen? Amen. Freely. Sister Susan, we're not hiding behind a bush this morning. Oh, God's been so good. He's done this. I I can't tell you how good He's been. No, I can stand up here boldly and say God's been good. Last night, I tell you, I didn't feel very well. I was studying, trying to get ready for the message. I was sick, didn't feel good at all. But when I made up in my mind, I texted my wife, or you can read the text. I said, honey, I'm going to do it. I don't care. I don't feel good, but I'm going to do it. That Holy Spirit fell on me and anointed me last night to pen these few words I got down. And I can tell you as I was praying and as I was writing and hearing and studying, that sickness just come off of me. And you can ask my wife, I told her after I got done, I said, I feel like a different man. Amen. So I come to talk to us this morning just for a little while for such a time as this. For such a time as this. If there's ever been a time if there's ever been a time for the church of the living God to stand and to be bold before the world and say, you know what, I'm not going to bow to you, devil. You're not going to take this. You're not going to take that. If there's ever been a time, today is today. For such a time as this. I think about that question Mordecai said, who knoweth whether thou art to come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What an honor to be asked that. That God would look down and say, Billy, I've called you for this purpose, for this time. There's so many million, billions of people on this planet, He could have called anybody, but He called me, and I'm so thankful for it this morning that I'm able to bring the gospel to you this, this morning. Excuse me. I really hope that we'll believe what God, that we will hear what I believe God has for us this morning. Like I said, I know it's been preached on a thousand times, but if you'll bear with me, I believe there's something. If there's ever been a time, church, is now. We have to stand. Who's standing in for the lost today? Are you praying every day for the lost, whether it's your family or not? Are you Now, one thing that really gets me, I remember when ISIS was a big deal, we heard it all over the news, and I would say, you know, they deserve what they get. The Lord checked my spirit and said, I died for that ISIS too. I died for that drunk. I died for that murderer. I died for this and I died for them. Just because you're a Christian and living right don't mean I died just for you, honey. I died for everybody. And so my prayer life has changed. I don't just pray for me and my four and no more. I'm praying for the ISIS to be saved. I'm praying that our president will get his head on straight and say, Jesus, I can't do it without you. Amen. Where are we? You see, Haman hated Mordecai and all the Jews and he had made a plan to kill them all. But this is the one thing that I love about God. There's many things, but this is one thing in particular. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to bring to you, evil-wise, it doesn't matter. God can turn around and make it good, amen? Has the devil ever tried to bring something in your life that was evil, but God said, hold on, honey, that might look rough right now, but give me just a moment. Let me work on it just a moment, and I'll turn it, and I'll make it good. I'll make it wonderful for you. Yes. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Now listen, that doesn't mean it's a bed of roses. How many of you ladies have ever baked a cake? How many of you men have ever attempted to bake a cake? Amen. The egg by itself, the egg yolk ain't good. Eating sugar by itself, to most people, is not good. But if you'll take all the ingredients of that cake, you know what I'm talking about. You put it in that bowl and you begin to mix it, begin to blend it together. It may not look as good as it should. Now, I'm thinking of a red velvet cake. I love red velvet cake. You put that thing in that oven, and just a little while that thing comes out. It's still hot. It's still moist. Put that white icing all over that thing. Woo you open it up. You cut you a slice, and you put it in your mouth. And two hours ago, it didn't look good. 
It didn't taste good, but now it tastes good. And I believe that's how that scripture is what that means. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, that are called according to His purpose. Honey, this morning you may go be going through something that you don't feel comfortable with. It may look nasty. It may stink. It may not taste good. But if you hold on just a little while, and just a little while, you're going to come out of that red velvet. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I know there's some of you this morning... Whether you're saved or not, the devil's tormented your mind. He's told you a thousand lies. You're nothing. You're a nobody. Nobody cares if you go to church. Nobody's going to miss you. It doesn't matter. Just don't go. Just stay out. But listen to me. If you're a child of God, you were called for this time. And if you're not saved, God's calling you this morning for such a time as this. God didn't just birth you and I to sit idly by and to watch everybody else do what God called you to do. You may say, well, I'm nobody. I can't do anything. You're right, we can't. But with the blood of Jesus on our life, we can. We can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Amen? God's called you for this time, for this purpose, for this day. He has a work for you. He has something that He wants you to do. And only you can do it. But you have to allow God to work it in your life. And just because it gets hard, just because you may slip, you may stumble, you may fall, it's all right. Get back up more times and the devil knocks you down and you'll make it. Stop listening to him. I want you to know there's nothing greater than being used by God. Nothing greater than being used by God Almighty. It doesn't matter, listen to me, it doesn't matter how climb, how high you climb in the world of success. It doesn't matter how many accolades you have, how many trophies you have. It doesn't matter all the posters on the wall tells you how good of a person you are. It doesn't matter if you don't have Jesus Christ, then you will be miserable. You have nothing without Christ. This morning I've come by to remind you that God's called you and you alone for such a time as this. He has a work for us to do. Amen. He's looking for someone though that's willing to say, you know what, this ain't my comfort zone, but I'm going to step out anyways. Jesus, I, I, I don't quite understand what I'm fixing to step out in. I don't see what's beneath me. But God, I'm going to step out in faith because God, you've never failed me. You've never forsaken me. You have been with me all of my life. He's looking for a vessel that'll say I'm getting out of my comfort zone. Looking for somebody to say, Lord, here am I. Here am I, God, take my vessel. Take this vessel, God, and use me. For the kingdom of God. Now listen, when you really began to pray like that, you really want to be used by God, hell's going to come. He's going to try to stop you. But remember, if you don't remember anything, remember this. God said you will make it. You will come through this valley. You will come through this trial. You will come out in the mountaintop. But just because you get on the mountaintop, be careful, there's another valley. And when you're down in the valley, look up because the mountaintop's coming. Amen? You will make it. You see, Haman hated them all. He wanted to destroy them. So as we read in the opening text, Mordecai goes to Esther and he commands her, please. And he pleads with her, please, for the lives of, for our lives, please go to the king on our behalf. Please go to him. And according to the law, she couldn't just go unto the king. She couldn't just kick the door open and say, here I am, honey. No, she couldn't do it. Unless the king was asked for her. But this is what she said and I love it. I wish more Christians today would say something like this. However, she said, I will go. And if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. We need to have this kind of heart for the kingdom of God. We need to say, if it'll cost me my life, oh well, honey, it'll cost me my life. You know, I hear people say it all the time. You know, I don't, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go now. I want to live life. I want to do this. I'm scared to death. Honey, don't, don't tempt me with heaven. When he calls for me, I'm out of here. Honey, I love you. Babies, I love you. But daddy's going to see Jesus. I want to see them grow up. I want them to see you get married and have kids and bring me them wonderful grandkids I hear so much about. But I'm not going to fear that crossing. Because on the other side, 
No more pain. No more heartaches. No more sorrows. No more disease. No sickness. No seizures. No cancer. Nothing like that. All we'll be doing is praising Jesus, the one who died for me. That reminds me of an old song. When he reached down his hand. He didn't just reach down like this. When he reached for me, he had to get down in the bottom of the barrel. He had to scrape the bottom. But I'm so thankful that he isn't like most of us just write people off. But he loves us so much that he'll reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. If I perish, I perish. I'm going to do the will of God. I'm going to go. I believe that the church... For the most part, listen to me, I'm not talking about Cross Park Church. I'm talking about the church across the board. But I believe that the church, for the most part, for today, has become a soft church. We say we have power. We say we have the anointing. We say we have this. We say we have that. But we don't have enough of God to knock a flea off a dog's back. Such as I have, give I to thee. I don't have money. I ain't got no money. But what I do have, I give unto thee. My God, if the churches, if we could get back to that, and I don't care what denomination it is, what I'm saying is if it is the unadulterated word of God, if it is the anointing of God, if it is the power of the Holy Ghost that comes in and breaks every chain, that sets the captives free, that heals the blinded eyes, that gets rid of the cancer. My God, if that's what comes into the church, then that's what I'm talking about. I want a move of God again like we've not seen in years. You may say, well, you're young. You've probably never seen a great move of God. No, when I was younger, I did. I've seen it. I remember the tent revivals. Sawdust on the floor. I remember those. I remember people getting happy, getting excited, and the Lord shouting and having a good time. I remember seeing people being healed. People having something wrong in their body. They come up for prayer, and the man of God lays his hands on them, and immediately God heals them. I've seen it. And that's what I want. But he's waiting on somebody to get out of their comfort zone. You know, we can't allow anything just to go. We can't just say, you know what, Brother Billy, we just got to love everybody. I agree, we do need to love everybody. But we can't just allow anything to go. Well, Brother Billy, if you say this or if you say that, you may offend them. You may hurt their feelings. Listen. We have to have the heart of God for people. We have to love people. But listen to me. Jesus is a man's man. Amen? Do you believe it? He's a man's man. I don't believe he walked around all scared. Amen. Sister Susan. Now the other day you were being a little critical. You were being a little too hard. You can't act. No. Jesus walked into the church. Listen to me. This is where it gets good. He walks into the church and he flips the tables over. Matthew 21, 12, and 13, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold the dove, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Listen to me. He flipped the tables over because they took the house of God and they began to rob people, began to rob God, and they done things that they shouldn't. And Jesus said, no, you're going to get that out of my house because my house will be called a house of prayer. Jesus run them out. He didn't say, oh, y'all got to leave. No, he flipped the tables and run them out. The rich young ruler, Matthew 19, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But the young man heard the saying and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You see the young man, he had so many possessions but he walked away sorrowful. Now, the Bible I read doesn't ever say he come back. and said, okay, here, I'll sell it all. The Bible that I read doesn't say Jesus run him down and said, Hold up. I'm sorry. I was too hard. I made it too easy. I, I didn't make it easy enough for you. I hurt your feelings. Please don't leave the church. I'll take it back. You don't have to do this. You don't have to. I'll even put a little sugar on it for you. 
No, Jesus said, sell all that you have and come follow me. You'll have a treasure in heaven. And the last I read, that young man walked away sorrowfully. You see, Jesus Christ gave everything for you and I. It's the least we can do for Him. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not that preacher's telling you sell everything. I'm not telling you to do that. But what I'm saying, if He asks you to do anything, you need to do it. It doesn't matter what it is. We should, be, we should be able to do whatever He asked of us. The problem was the young man wasn't willing to put Christ before and above all his possessions. We must be willing to give up anything that Christ asked of us. Our commitment to Him can be nothing less. Amen? I just had a thought. It ran off, so we're going to leave it. We're moving on. You see, Esther was willing to die for what she believed in. Church, are we willing to die for Christ? Are we willing to stand and say, though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. What would happen if somebody walked in the back doors this morning? A gang of men walked in with guns and said, if you love God, go to this side. If you deny Christ, come over here and you live. What would we do? What would we do? Would we be able to stand? I hope and pray that if that was to ever happen to me, that I would stand and say, you know what? He's done so much for me. I don't have enough time this morning to tell you all that He's done, but He's done so much for me. And if you're going to kill me because I love Jesus, well then, honey, you better load the gun because I love Jesus. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to cower down just because you put something to my head. I'm going to stand because Christ gave all for me. You see, there's nothing worth losing your soul over Church, we're called for this time. We're called to do what God's called us to do. In order to do it, we have to stand. We have to fast. We have to pray. We have to read the Word of God. We have to spend time with God. It, I, I'm going to get on a soapbox for just a second. People, people say they love God. I'm not saying they don't. People say they love God, but I've I done a study one time and it says the average preacher, pastor... Praise less than five minutes a week. The average Christian is less than one or two minutes a week. But yet we love God. How many of you are married in here? How long do you think your marriage will last if you talk to them for one minute a week? It wouldn't. But yet we're doing it to God every day. We're doing it to God every day. God, I'll make time for you when I finish this. God, I've got to do this. God, I'm busy. i got to do this. God, I, just, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, we've got to make time for God again. Because such a time as this, today is the day. God's called us to do it today, not tomorrow. We have to live for today. we got to pray for our family members that are not saved. It's time to stand. It's not time to sit back and put it on cruise. Well, if they get saved, they do. No, it's time that we're fervent about what we do. It's time that we're fasting and praying and seeking the mind of God. If you don't pray for them and intercede for them, who will? If you don't pray for your own family, who else is going to pray for them? You love them more than anybody. You see, we're prayers... We're answered prayers of our grandparents, of our parents. I don't know about you, but I had a praying grandmother. Sometimes she'd make me nervous. I'd walk into the room. I knew if I'd done something I shouldn't, I wouldn't even go to her house. I'd call her and say, hey, Granny, how you doing? It's so good to talk. I'd love you coming by, honey. Well, Granny, I'm busy. I, I got, well, just come see Granny for a minute. So then I'd go and see, she'd be like, well, I know why you didn't want to come see me, son. I'm, I honestly, I felt like she knew everything I did, whether it was right or wrong. I felt like God just would tell her everything. She was a praying grandmother, though. I mean, she prayed all the time. She was one of the greatest women in my life. She impacted me so much. And I miss her dearly. But I can tell you right now, that woman's having her a time. She's shouting. She's running. She's flipping. She's hollering. She's doing all kinds of things that she couldn't do in the natural. Amen? 
She's having her a time. And I wish for just a moment the Lord allow me sometimes just to see how she's having a time in heaven. She was one of the greatest women in my life. She prayed every day for her family. She prayed every day for the neighborhood. She prayed every day for the church and for the pastor. How many of us pray for our pastor every day? You don't have to raise your hand. But if there's ever been a time to pray for your pastor, it's now. Every day that man gets up, he prays. He seeks the mind of God to find what God wants for every service. I can promise you, he ain't getting on the internet. Give me a sermon, Google. Okay, sermon title this. No. He's laying before God. He's crying and praying every day. And I promise you, the attack of the enemy on our pastor is greater than it's ever been. It's greater on any man or woman of God that is proclaiming the true gospel of Christ, that's preaching the cross. I'm telling you that the heat's been turned up on a man or a woman of God that really loves God. Pray for your pastor. If you, if you run out of things to pray for, I mean, you can pray for him for hours. I mean, he needs it. The pastor needs it. You see, I want my kids and my grandkids to remember me. Say, my dad was a praying man. My grandfather was a praying man. He pushed for the kingdom of God more than anything. And you can ask my kids this. I love them. They play sports. I love sports. But I always make it a point. To my kids, I'll tell them, if you score 30 points or if you score 2 points, Daddy's proud of you. I love you. If you ever make it to the big leagues or if you don't, Daddy loves you anyways. And I tell them, I would rather you serve God. I would rather you serve God and not have a, a pot to pee in than to be a multimillionaire playing football or playing volleyball, whatever it is. I said, I would rather you love God more than anything in this world. I want you to serve God no matter what. Whenever they score a goal, whenever they make a touchdown, whatever it is, I get happy. I get excited. I'm loud. In case you didn't know, I have a big mouth. I'm loud. I get excited. But whenever they're out there and they score, I scream, I'm happy, but I'm never as happy as I am when I see them playing an instrument for the kingdom of God or when I see them at the altars at prayer meeting or when they pick up their Bible and they begin to read and come and ask Dad questions. Dad, what does this mean? Dad, what does this mean? I can promise you I'd rather hear them ask me that than to see them make a multi-million dollar contract for the Miami Dolphins. I'm their biggest fan, but God's even greater. Whenever they pick their Bibles and they read about the goodness of God, it melts my heart to see them doing things for the kingdom of God. I don't know if any of you remember, but the first time Zach ever sat on the drums, he was playing. I told Wendy afterwards, I said, I had to kind of repent. I said, my chest kind of started sticking out. That's my baby. That's my boy. And I remember just... And now he's to the point, I say, son, you playing drums? Yes, sir, daddy. And he'll even come up to me, dad, can I play the drums this morning? It's just, it does my heart so good to see my kids wanting to do the things of God. And not just my kids, but any kids that love God, that want to do it for the kingdom of God, I love it. But it's time, church, we stand in the gap for them. The young people are facing things that we didn't have to face at their age, or maybe not on the level that they're facing them. How many of you ever had a teacher or a student tell the principal they need to put a litter box in the bathroom because they're a gerbil now or something like that? Right here over in Rogersville. They identify as an animal. Walk around, got a leash on, a collar on their neck and a leash. The things that they see, the things that they hear and people say, well, that's just normal. No, honey, it ain't normal. That ain't normal. That is not of God. If God wanted you to be an animal, He'd have created you to be a dog or something. But He didn't because He loves you. He wants you to be His son or to be His daughter. You say, well, I don't have any kids. That's not true. Your spiritual fathers and mothers and grandparents to younger people. One person that's so dear to my heart is Sister Janet. She's a spiritual mother to me. 
I love to see her heart for the kingdom of God. It don't matter. Anything she's asked to do, she'll do it. If she can't, she'll try her best to do it. And it's people like that. People like Sister Susan. People like Sister Brenda. People like our pastor and his wife. They just love God. Want to do what God wants them to do. You are a spiritual father. You are a spiritual mother to people. Satan is trying to destroy the church every day. Who will be the one that will stand for such a time as this? John chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, to destroy. I come that that might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. I'm so glad that Jesus is here for you and I every day. It doesn't matter the time of day or the time of night. It doesn't matter. He's always there. I want to talk real quickly about Shammah. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 11 and 12. And after him was Shammah the son of Agi the Herat, and the Philistines were gathered together in a troop. And there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. Get to verse 12. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. The Philistines were coming, taking their food, taking their food, causing them to starve. and was going to put them into slavery. But he said, not today, devil. And I believe this is where the church needs to be. Not today, devil. You're not getting my pea patch. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you are a liar. The enemy came and he saw all of this and he seen different things. He came for two reasons. To inflict casualty and to destroy the crops. You see, the devil doesn't care that we're having church this morning. He don't care if you come to church. He don't mind us singing. He don't mind us preaching. He don't mind us doing anything we do unless we decide that we're going to really serve God. As long as it's just a, a one, two, three of religion, as long as it's just you do this or you do that, just come and we'll sing a song or two and the preacher will preach and then we'll go home. The devil don't mind that. But the devil will attack us whenever we decide to be serious about serving God. Trouble will come. The devil will attack us when we pray in fervent spirit. He will attack us when we reach out and begin to witness for the glory of God. He will attack us whenever we start to praise the name of God in this place. He will attack us whenever we decide, I'm not satisfied to be where I'm at today. I don't want to look like that. I don't want to act like that. I don't want to be what I am, but I want to get closer to God. And he will attack us whenever we get to that point. Whenever we decide we're going to take a stand for God, look out because trouble's on the way. But as long as we do nothing, we're no threat to the devil. But let just a few people get in the house of God and allow them to get excited about Jesus. You better look out because the enemy's coming, honey. He's going to try to take your pee pads. But it's time for the men. It's time for the women of God to stand up and say, it doesn't matter if I'm by myself. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what you think. As long as I stand, as long as I do what God's called me to do, devil, you're not getting my pee patch. Devil, this church belongs to God. We are God's people people and you can't have it. Devil, you better move on out. By the grace of God, you're not destroying my pea patch. It's mine. It's mine. The world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. We're engaged in the greatest struggle that the world has ever known. I'm hurrying. God's working to reach a world for His name's sake. And the devil's fighting Him every step of the way. All the while, God's placed the church in the world to be a light for God's glory. And I'm going to be a part. I'm going to be a part. Many times we won't take the stand to protect which that the Lord has given us. My God, give us some men, give us some women that will stand and say, you're not taking my pea patch, devil.
You see, it wasn't just a time of great conflict, but there was great courage. The Bible told us that he stood. He resolved in his heart that I'm going to fight. He said, I'm going to fight even if it costs me my life. Because you see, there's things that's worth fighting for. Amen? So it is in the church. We can't just stand back and watch the church go the way of the world. I've said it a thousand times. When the church looks more like the world than the world looks like the world, we're in bad shape. We're in a bad place. We can't just allow the church to go the way of the world. We can't just run away and hide while the enemy tramples everything we love under his feet. We can't run. We can't hide. Because for such a time as this, God has called us to stand. We have to decide this morning that we'll stand. We make up our minds. We're tired of seeing the devil hinder the work of God. Resolve it in our hearts today that there are things worth fighting for. He fought because he knew that the people would die without food. They would perish. He said, I'm going to defend the fields. Here's a few things this morning I just want to tell you that are worth fighting for in this day and time. The church. The lost. The Word of God. I've done a study history thing on the Bible at times. And it just amazes me. I can't remember how to say his name. Started with the V, but he said that he was going to destroy the Bible after he's dead and gone. The Bible will be destroyed, and within a hundred years, his very home was bought to be a printing place for the Word of God. What the devil meant for evil, God's. I feel like God's got a sense of humor. Devil, you said you're going to stop my word. Matter of fact, I'm going to take that trash, that garbage, that hell hole that was living here. I'm going to take that and remove it. And I'm going to put a printing press right there where hell once stood. A pastor back home, Pastor Schutz, told me or told the church, he said, God said, you'll have this land where the church is now. Before the church was there, it was a bar room. He said, you will fill the house and the presence and the glory of God will come. Today there sits a building there that'll hold twelve hundred people. <laughs> Nothing. It wasn't Pastor Shoots. He'll tell you it wasn't him. He was willing, but God, but God did it. The church, the word of God, old fashioned praying, preaching, praising the Lord. Now this one's hard for a lot of people, but we got to live clean, people. Clean living. The reputation of the church, our families, our young people, etc. These are just some important things that are literally worth dying for. Where are the shamas that will stand up and fight for the things of God? You see, he slew the enemies of the people of God because he fought. He enjoyed a great victory. Had he run away like others, he would have been a coward and he would have been defeated and the enemy would have prevailed. Friends, we must take a stand for the things of God for such a time as this. Take our stand for what is right and what is important. If we don't, then who will? Somebody will. Somebody's going to stand for something they believe in, whether it's right or wrong. Whether it's right or wrong, somebody's standing for something. There's people that think homosexuality is right. It's not. The church has to stop being silent. We have to stand I love this. We have to stand for the things of God. If we don't stand and fight for what we believe in, and when these things are gone, we can't complain because we did it ourselves. You see, the Lord defeated the enemy. He allowed Shama the ability to stand. He gave him the power to fight. But through it all, it was God. Because one man was willing to stand... The fields were protected and the people were saved from starvation. Church, I'm closing. Where are we? You see, we're called for such a time as this. If I perish, then I perish. Devil, you're not getting my pea patch. If I die, let me die in the armies of God. Let me die on the battlefield fighting for the kingdom of God. Devil, you're not having what God gave me. I'm not allowing you to take what God has given me. You see, there's so many others that are in the Bible, but we just don't have time. 
to talk about the goodness of God in all the different avenues and all the different passages of Scripture where they stood for such a time as this. For such a time as this. If you would, let's stand and let's bow our heads.